Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 says there's a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant and a time to harvest. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. Jesus tells his disciples that there's a time to be full of sorrow and there's a time to be full of joy. He said, you will weep and lament and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. You now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice. And Jesus then gives an illustration of a woman who is about ready to give birth to a child. That uh, she who, when in labor, has sorrow and pain, but after the child is born, she no longer remembers the pain, but is filled with joy in the birth of a child. So also, the disciples will be full of sorrow, but in the resurrection, their tears will be turned to joy. First there is a Good Friday, then there is an Easter. First there is life here on earth, and then there is our life in heaven. We will learn today that when sin, suffering, tragedy, and death affects us, it is a time of sorrow. But when there is faith in Christ, trust in the forgiveness of sins, then it's a time for joy. When there is a birth, a confirmation, a graduation, or any other happy event, then it's a time for joy. Today is a joyful day because Christ rose from the dead. Sins are forgiven. It's a joyful day because God will give you the strength to persevere through bad days. Our text took place in the upper room on the night in which Jesus was betrayed. We call Monday Thursday. John chapters 16 and 17, Jesus is, is teaching them. He's talking with them, certainly uh, before he is taken away from them uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said to them in the upper room, A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. And you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. You now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. We get the impression that Jesus is going somewhere. Where is he going? Jesus is present with his disciples now, but there will be a time when he will leave them. Jesus said, a little while and you will not see me. Again, where is he going? Later that night, Jesus was taken from them when he was arrested um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the next day, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was nailed and crucified to a cross for our sins and, and, and on our behalf. He died and was buried. Because Jesus was taken away from the disciples he was, and was crucified, the disciples experienced sorrow, anguish, pain, sadness, and grief. Jesus' words came true. The disciples wept and lamented while the world, namely the Jewish leaders, rejoiced over the fact that Jesus of Nazareth is now dead and is crucified. After Jesus' death, the disciples wept because they were separated from, their, from, the, from the one they had been with for over three years. Their companion their master, their teacher. Where do they go now? What do they do? 
They were even found behind locked doors for fear of the Jews. Jesus' words came true. The disciples experienced sorrow. Does Jesus promise us a rose garden, a life perfect with no problems? No. Does Jesus promise that the life of the Christian will always be fine and happy? No. Jesus once said, in this world you will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And as long as we lived in a fallen, sin-filled world, life will never be without problems, life will never be without sin, and we will always be tempted by the devil, the world, and even our sinful flesh. The prosperity preachers of today preach a false message. They will say that if you are healthy, wealthy, and wise, then it's because you are doing something good to deserve it. And if you are sick and poor and foolish, then God must be punishing you. These false preachers will say that if you follow their so-called biblical principles, that you will have little trouble, if any, at all. They focus on a message of glory, a glory on earth. And very seldom talk about sin, repentance, cross, or suffering, or endurance for Christ's sake. But no message like this from the prosperity preachers is found in God's word. Rather, Jesus is realistic. He's honest. He's forthright. And he tells the truth. He said to his disciples, you will have trouble. And he said, in this world, you will have tribulations. But why? Why do we suffer from disease and cancer and sickness and family arguments and sin? Why is there sorrow and pain and death in our world? Why does our sinful flesh create idol God after idol God? Why are we unable to fear, love, and trust in God above all things? Why are there thieves and murders, drought and floods? Evil and suffering are in our world because of sin. And it was the devil who tempted Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, and of their own free will they gave in and ate it. Satan is a cause of our problems. He is a cause of our pain and sorrow and sin and death into our world. Satan is your enemy. But God is on your side and he is one who loves you and cares for you. Even during the dark and depressing days of, in, in our lives. Look at the cross. There you see a God who suffered for you and in your place. God is not a God who knows nothing about suffering, but he came in the flesh of his own son, who, took upon a, who, who fulfilled the law perfectly in our place, took upon our flesh, fulfilled the law, suffered in our place, bore the wrath of God, made the payment for our sins. How do you know that God loves you? God's love is not determined by the things that God that take place in your life, in you, or around you, or how much you have or own. But God's love is determined when you look at the cross. And there in the cross, you see God's love for you. Yes, Jesus was on a journey, and the cross was his destination. That was his goal. That was his mission. Jesus said to his disciples, A little while and you will not see me, because he will be crucified. He will suffer and die. But Jesus goes on to say, in a little while and you will see me. In other words, they will see him on Easter morning, on the resurrection. And sure enough, on Easter Sunday, the disciples saw the risen Christ. Their sorrow was turned into joy. And when they saw the risen Christ, their heart rejoiced. 
And even John chapter 20 says, Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, And your joy no one will take from you. And this came true. Jesus ascended up into heaven. The day of Pentecost came. And the, the, the apostles then spread the word of God to all nations, even if it meant martyrdom. The, their joy no one will take from them. They know who Christ is and what he did, and they, they proclaim that message to all nations, even if it meant persecution or martyrdom. Today is a joyful day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. Sin is now paid for. Heaven is opened. The devil is defeated. Jesus crushed the head of Satan and won victory over him. And death is defeated. Jesus overcame this enemy by rising from the dead. Psalm 68, our introit for today, calls us to shout for joy to God all the earth. That's why today is also called Jubilate Sunday, carrying the theme of joy in rejoicing over what God has done for us. Philippians 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. 1 Peter 4 says, Be glad with exceeding joy. Be glad in the forgiveness of sins, that Christ has defeated our enemies. And that life and, sal and salvation is yours in Christ. The hymn that we just sang went like this. With high delight, let us unite in songs of great jubilation. Why? Because Christ has risen from the dead and lives forevermore. Yes, this is a joyful day. Sins are removed. The gospel is preached and the Lord's Supper is given for the forgiveness of all your sins. But our joy will not last forever. The Christian, the, 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 the Christian life is mixed with weeping and laughing, heartache and gladness, sorrow and joy, cross, and resurrection. St. Paul says, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And St. Paul is being honest that life on earth is involved with suffering. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory of heaven. And so, yes, we suffer in a fallen, sin-filled world. Jesus said to his disciples, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while and you will see me. And this little while lasted three days. Jesus was crucified and buried, but three days later, they saw him again. For us, we live in the joy of the resurrection, but Christ has ascended. We see him no longer. We will see him certainly when he comes again on the last day. Isaiah 40 says that, says that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so as you walk through, our, through your everyday life, continue to persevere, knowing that the Lord loves you and cares for you, that he is your refuge and strength. We don't see Jesus, but we hear his word. He speaks to us. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. We hear his word. We hear his voice. We don't see him, but his body and blood is present in the Lord's Supper, hidden under bread and wine. We don't see him, but he is with us always, even to the end of the age. God is not a God who is absent from us and far away and distant. 
But he is with us always with his word and sacrament, his presence today. Dearly beloved, when you go through suffering, pain, and sorrow, be assured that Christ is with you. He has not abandoned you. Isaiah 40 says, God gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. 1 Peter 1 gives you the promise that you will be shielded by God's power. You are his baptized lamb, his child, who will be created and redeemed, and you are dearly loved by him. Jesus gives you the promise, saying, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. God also gives you the promise that all things will work together for good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his promise. All things will work together even through the difficult days in our life. God's grace will be sufficient for you in the midst of trouble. His power will be made perfect in weakness. And in a world ruined by sin, God will help you to endure the troubles and the sufferings that come into your life. The greatest strength of all is from his word and sacrament. Through the preached gospel, God reminds you of his love for you, and in the sacrament, he bestows upon you the forgiveness of sins. He also strengthens and preserves you steadfast in the one true faith. And so there is a time to be born and a time to die. There's a time to plant, a time to harvest. harvest. There's a time of sorrow and a time of joy. There is life on earth and there will be life in heaven. God grant that while you remain here on earth, he may fill you with resurrection joy that you may anticipate the resurrection joy of heaven. Amen. <clears throat> now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the life everlasting. Amen. <clears throat>